Good evening again. Thank you all for your patience. We will get started. Um, people will be able to join as we continue the conversation, but at least we will get started approximately on time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, on behalf of myself and all the organizations I represent, including both progressive movements here in the UK, uh, the liberal movement, and the reform, uh, reform Judaism, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us in the run-up to Israel's 70th birthday. Uh, she's young and she's old all at the same time, and there's so much we can learn from where we're at today. This evening's conversation is going to be with Rabbi Noah of the Israel Religious Action Center. She is with us, thankfully, uh, from, from Israel itself this evening, was kind enough to join us even in a slightly later hour than we are now. She is currently the director of the Israel Religious Action Center, which is the social justice arm of the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism, our sister movement in Israel. She is charged with leading a staff uh, there of organizing and developing and implementing social change. Uh, everything from, excuse me, everything from working with um, the separation of religion and state, women's rights, and the struggle with racism. Before joining IRAC, she worked for Jerusalem Open House, an LGBT community center in Jerusalem. Um, she has lots to share with us, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Noah. Just a, a thought before Noah gets started. It's also at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a couple things that you can ask questions or raise your hand during the programming. This will alert me that you have a question, or um, if Noah asks a question and she wants you to raise hands, that's also a way to do that. If you have any issues at all, don't, don't worry about asking a question. You're more than welcome to, and I will um, try to answer you behind the scenes. So... Noah, good evening and welcome to England. Hey, uh, I'm so uh, happy to be with all of you this evening. Um, and I'm um, really eager for this to be a conversation. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I thought I'd speak um, briefly about what IREC does and then I'm happy for you to kind of direct me to whatever is more interesting for, uh, for you for me to expand on. Uh, and then we'll move from there. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna steal a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was born here in Jerusalem to um, a really secular Israeli Jewish family. We had uh, very little to do with religion. Um, and my path to becoming a rabbi and to working with IREC uh, went through social change work. So, um, so it, I began uh, by being the head of the Jerusalem Open House, which is the LGBT center here in Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem is probably the most religious city in the world that has a gay center in it. So I really got to witness how religion can play a destructive role and an oppressive role in people's lives and how religion can be a force for liberation and for helping people be all that they can be. Um, and back then it was the only LGBT organization in town. So I got to work, you know, with Palestinian lesbians and ultra-Orthodox gay men in every different sector of Jerusalem society that you can imagine. Um, and when I left there, I really wanted to look at social justice issues from a broader perspective than the LGBT perspective. So I joined an organization called Meet, which was founded in MIT in Boston. Uh, and it's an um, educational program for outstanding Israeli and Palestinian high school students. Um, and that was also a really interesting learning experience for me. And one of the things that um, was my major goal or my major challenge in the organization was looking at how reluctant the Israeli students were to engage with the Palestinian students uh, in the initial stages of the program. And that was really baffling to me because the, you know, the Israeli students had all the advantages uh, you know, it was their environment. They didn't have to go through checkpoints. Um, and the more I tried to figure it out, the more I looked into it, the more I did separate workshops and conversations, the more it became apparent to me that the Palestinian students came with a really strong um, narrative, a really strong sense of self, both religiously and nationally. And the Palestinian students who were 
the Palestinian students came with a really strong narrative and the Israeli students who were brilliant, we chose 20 out of 600 applicants from the best high schools. Um, and they were all secular Jews. They couldn't articulate anything about their identity that didn't have to do with the Holocaust. Um, so kind of answers to the big questions of, you know, why am I Jewish? Why is it important to have a Jewish state? Um, what are my values? They had a very difficult time even beginning to articulate answers to those questions. And that experience has really led me to an understanding that has deepened since that this void that we have as a progressive camp in Jewish identity doesn't only impact things like what we do on Shabbat or how we celebrate holidays, which are our weddings, which are very, very important questions, uh, but it has a profound impact on how we see ourselves and how we see the other um, and, and how we approach questions of justice. Um, so that's what led me really to, to Iraq and where I am today, where I get to think about the development of a progressive Jewish identity and, and values and movement in Israel. Um, so uh, I want to jump right into talking about um, the work of Iraq. But before that, I want to, you know, kind of remind us all that um, love is what remains after you know the truth. So, uh, you know, this is going to be very hard truths about Israel in the next uh, 20 minutes. But that is because um, we believe that all of these things can be changed and rectified and, and improved. And that's what we, you know, the knowledge is the first step to, to this upcoming change. So um, IRAC is a social justice arm of the reform movement in Israel. The uh, mission of the reform movement uh, is to make Israel accessible, make Judaism in Israel accessible to Jews, which sounds like it should be really simple because, you know, unlike in Britain, everybody here speaks Hebrew and we have a large majority of Jews and, you know, our calendar is the Hebrew calendar. Um, and what makes it challenging is the fact that historically we have had no separation of religion and state. And so the average Israeli secular Jew um, that's been polled again and again and again, they associate um, Judaism with racism, with misogyny, and most closely with corruption. Um, and so they stay away from Judaism because they're, they don't want to be associated with all those negative um, uh, ideas or values. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to build bridges for them to come and experience and reclaim their Jewish identity. And we do that in three different ways. One is you know, through you know, congregations all over Israel where people can come and experience Reform Judaism and celebrate life cycle events and be part of Reform communities. We do that through educational um, work um, in um, kindergartens and schools and high schools and uh, non-formal education. And we do that through um, social change work, both because we believe that Tikkun Olam is a mitzvah and we're committed to it, and also because um, we believe that that is one of the ways for Israelis to really understand what we're all about by making our values part of the real political and, and public life in Israel. So IRAC works on, on the intersections of religion and uh, society. We have four major issues. Um, one is the issue that you kind of can assume that we would be working on, which is the issue of uh, um, equality for the uh, non-Orthodox streams of Judaism in Israel. Um, so, uh, the, on the macro level, and I'm happy to, to dive deeply into the micro level if you want it uh, later, the Israeli government spends about 3 billion shekels. That's, I don't know how to do the math in pounds. I'll, tell, I'll give it to you in, in dollars. It's about $800 million a year on the Orthodox monopoly. Um, and that's you know, that doesn't even include the Orthodox education system that's overfunded. It's just $800 million for 
synagogues and, and ritual baths and, and rabbi salaries and shoot inspectors and religious councils, a huge mechanism. Um, and it funds conservative and reform institutions and, um, uh, and synagogues and even other progressive secular Jewish institutions all together with about 20 million shekels a year. I mean, that's the, that's the difference. That's, that's the gap that our communities are still struggling with. Um, and that's the level, level, the playing field that we're still trying to level. So that's our first issue. Um, our second issue uh, is the issue of the dismantling of the Orthodox monopoly. So the Orthodox monopoly has um, a profound um, influence on people's lives here, not only in terms of religious pluralism, but on many other uh, levels. Um, I'll give two examples of things that we do. Um, one is the issue um, of uh, marriage and divorce, uh, which is in Israel. So we're using a system that we inherited not from the British mandate, but from the Ottoman Empire, a system that basically means that there is no civil divorce, just religious uh, marriage or divorce are all done in religious courts of the different religious denominations. Uh, and in Judaism, there's only one religious denomination, which is orthodoxy. Um, so that means both that uh, people can't have a reform or a conservative or a, uh, or a civil marriage. Um, and it also means, so for example, the couples that I marry, you know, with a chuppah and a ketubah and seven blessings and everything uh, that you can think of that's associated with a, a Jewish wedding, uh, they are, uh, um, that wedding is not recognized in Israel. And then they um, hop on a plane and go to Cyprus, which is the closest foreign country, uh, where the second largest industry is marrying Israeli and Lebanese couples. Um, and there, the Archbishop of Florinica is going to marry them under a big cross, and that wedding will be rec recognized uh, in Israel. Um, and to top that kind of absurd, then uh, the real Part of the problem is in the, the process of divorce, because while there's a workaround for marriage and about 20% of the couples who get married in Israel do not bring um, marriages certif marriage certificates from rabbis, but they bring marriage certificates from Cyprus, um, about there is no um, workaround for divorce. So about over 30% of the couples who get divorced have to go through these religious courts um, that are part of the Israeli judicial system in the same way that our Supreme Court, which is, you know, a beacon of human rights is part of the system, but also the religious courts are part of the system. Um, so um, uh, in the Jewish rabbinic courts, for example, women are not allowed to testify. That's a um, principle of halakha, of Jewish law. So they literally, literally have no voice in front of the court. Obviously, all of the judges are male rabbis. Um, and the civil divorce, as well as the religious get, depend completely on the consent of the husband. So he could be abusive or in jail or living with another woman or abroad or in a coma. There's no divorce until he says that he agrees to it. Uh, in the Muslim and the Sharia courts, um, while uh, the woman can decide that she wants the divorce and, and uh, act on it, the, the husband doesn't need even to be there. If she wants to remarry, the kids automatically go to the custody of the ex-husband. Uh, and in the Catholic courts, there is no divorce, just annulment through the Vatican, and that takes years and years and years of waiting. That's a completely insane system of running marriage and divorce. The good news is that um, a, major, a large majority of Israelis want to change the system. The bad news is that the political system in Israel makes change on this extremely difficult. And I think that this will be one of the last issues that we went on the, uh, in terms of separation of religion and state. Uh, and I'm happy to expand on that later. 
I want to give another example of our work against the Orthodox monopoly, um, which is uh, the issue of public transportation on Shabbat. Um, so all of you that have visited Israel on Shabbat have noticed how quiet it is because there is no public transportation, which for quietness, it's great, but it has a huge amount of implications uh, on Israeli society. Um, for example, it has, you know, the socioeconomic um, ramifications that you can, you know, probably guess the like families that don't, can't afford a car or stack home on Shabbat and can't visit family and can go to the beach and are basically stuck. Uh, there, there are also environmental ramifications because uh, of the fact that there is no public transportation on Shabbat, more Israelis own cars and then they use them on Shabbat and during the week. Uh, and that kind of um, changes our entire thinking about public transportation. Um, there's also uh, an accessibility issue. There are many types of people with dif different disabilities, including Asperger's and epilepsy and all sorts of uh, sight impairments that um, cannot have a driver's license. So they also are dependent on public transportation and are stuck home on Shabbat. Um, and the last layer of that for me was the most meaningful and most compelling that is that there's a um, safety issue here. The, uh, the most lethal night of the week every weekend, every week in Israel is the night between Friday and Saturday um, when people don't, you know, go out and don't have access to public transportation. Um, and so we, we have, are working with a large coalition on these issues and trying to, um, to, uh, to bring a new reality um, and, and, and change the, the control of the rabbinate on people's lives. And I'm hope, I am optimistic that in the next couple of years, we, can, we will be able to see a breakthrough on, on that. So that's our second issue. We have uh, equality for the non-Orthodox streams. We have the Orthodox monopoly. Our third issue is the issue of um, gender segregation in the public sphere. Um, and uh, so gender segregation in the public sphere is a new phenomenon in Jewish life. It began in 1999 with two uh, gender segregated uh, public bus lines. Uh, gender segregated bus lines are bus lines where women um, board in the back and sit in the back and men board in the front and basically sit wherever they want. Um, and that phenomena began in 1999, and by 2010, there were 96 bus lines all over Israel where gender segregation was the norm. Um, and once we have, uh, um, and in 2010, we won an appeal uh, in the Supreme Court uh, that stated that segregation is discrimination, and we're very proud as the reform movement to be laying such an important foundation uh, in the building of the Israeli democracy. Um, and since, but between 1999 and 2010, gender segregation really, you know, spread into many, many other areas of public life. It existed in cemeteries and post offices and health clinics um, and uh, in playgrounds, really in many, many different areas of life. And we've been working since then um, with the Attorney General to create new guidelines for this and then to make sure that these are enforced. Um, so that was our third issue. Um, our fourth issue, which is our most complex one and the one that we're dedicating a majority of our efforts to is the issue of the struggle against racism. Um, we have been, uh, IRAC was founded 30 years ago as a religious freedoms organization. Uh, and in the past decade and much more so in the past uh, three years, we have been dedicating a large amount of our efforts uh, um, to the struggle against racism. That is both a reaction to the rise in racism in Israel and also um, part of our understanding of how uh, racism plays out in these um, settings. Uh, so, um, well, I'm gonna just speak for three more minutes. Uh, one of our, um, the people we work against is uh, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, who is the chief rabbi of the city of Safed, of Tzfat in the north of Israel. Um, so Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, who is ranked in civil service like a judge, it's a very high position in civil service. Uh, and he sits in city hall in Tzfat, 
And from his office in city, city Hall, he operates a hotline. And you can call that hotline if your neighbor rented their apartment to, a, to an Arab. And if some, when somebody calls that hotline, the rabbi would use city resources to track down the neighbor and tell him things like, it's against halakha, it's against Jewish law to rent apartments to Arabs, uh, and you're endangering our daughters and risking our society. Um, and, and he would start very nicely and escalate until if this, the, the neighbor persists in, rent, in wanting to rent their apartment to an Arab, uh, the rabbi would issue an excommunication, a cherem, so that that person can go into any of the synagogues in Sfat. Um, so I think that that's an example of somebody who is a civil servant, um, who's not, who is really using all of his power to incite racism, and he couldn't have done that in any other position other than rabbi. Um, so we've been fighting very hard to get him fired, and we're hopeful that this year may be the year where we, were, we are able to, to succeed in doing that. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here, and I'm really looking for you to direct me in terms of what would be uh, most interesting for you to hear more about or to kind of if you have any questions or thoughts or comments. So everyone, if you want to use the chat feature, this will allow you to type in questions, comments, uh, things you'd like to learn more about from Noah, and we will open the floor. Noah, one of the things that you and I had talked about sort of ahead of time, and um, maybe we can start here, is sort of the link between the social justice work that you all do and some of the foundations here in the UK and sort of what that connection looks like, specifically with Art Zenu. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, I think that the, um, there are different venues for, uh, for, uh, British Jews to, to influence what is going on in Israel. And one of those ways is uh, by increasing the power that we have in the World Zionist organizations. Um, um, and that is uh, a huge tool, both in terms of the resources of the Zionist world and how they're distributed in response to how, you know, we discussed how resources are distributed in Israel in a discriminatory way. So that's one of our ways to compensate against it. And also to be able to get um, the Zionist organizations to voice our values. Uh, and so we have in, had in the past and still have now a large delegation and a large amount of influence in the Zionist or, um, organizations. And it's um, crucial that we maintain and even increase that power so any involvement in Artenu is one of the things that helps us uh, um, sustain and increase our power. Thank you so much, Noah. I did have a question, and I thank the participant for asking this. If the questions asked are private, they are. Only the panelists, so myself and Noah, are, will be seeing the questions. So feel free to ask anything. Your name will not be revealed. Uh, it's, it's very private. Um, so please feel free to ask any question you might have. Noah, can you see questions on your side as well, just to verify? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. So we've got one in here um, that I, I'm sure you're seeing it. I'd, yeah, I'd yeah. like you to address so there, so there, So there's a question um, um, about uh, the charges against Netanyahu um, and gearing up for an election. So first of all, um, the date of the, uh, the scheduled dates for the election is, is November, 2019. Um, it's also important to note that since 1981, we have not had one government that served a full term. So most of our governments, because of the political system, uh, collapse uh, midterm. Uh, so, and that way I would be, it's not impossible that this government will fulfill all of its uh, time, but it's certainly um, not, uh, uh, not unlikely that there will be early elections. Um, I just spent a day in the Knesset last week and, you know, I met with 
10 Knesset members and each one of them told me, you know, changed my mind about whether we're going to elections or not going to elections. Um, but I am hoping that this, what we can, and, and we can, we, it looks like we're very close to elections, but we have been here before and Netanyahu, who is returning from the States, can still re resolve the current political disagreement about um, a bill drafting, uh, about a bill about the drafting of ultra-Orthodox Jews. Um, the bigger questions are the investigations about his uh, uh, different and multiple corruption charges. Um, and what we're hoping for and what we're trying to also figure out how we fit into is how we bring back the culture of, you know, decency, honesty, um, humility, and public service, which is really kind of, kind of it's devastating to see uh, what our, what our, um, with our, both our uh, media system and also our government's been involved in such intense levels of uh, corruptions, if the charges are indeed true. Thank you so much, Noah, for answering that question. I know it's not a simple answer. Um, we've had another question come in that's predominantly about youth. Uh, if you could address that question, I think that would be really excellent. It's a great place. Okay. Um, hold on, I'm reading the question. No, nope, go ahead. You read the question. I'll read the question out to the audience. So okay. basically the question is surrounding youth um, and to find the right balance with education with youth. They know that things, um, you know, aren't always how they should be in Israel uh, and that some of the things that Israel is doing, they view is very bad. And, and if we don't talk about it and educate about it, they think we're lying. Um, so how do we get them to understand and love Israel um, while keeping the education real and honest um, and to, to kind of walk both sides of the line. I think, you know, I turn to you, you're, you're the experts, but you know, I'm just, I have um, a four year old twins and I'm now dealing with the Barbie crisis. Um, so one of my major principles is we bring Barbies into our home. I'm not banning them. I want to, you know, to dismantle all of the negative stereotypes with them. I'm not going to leave them alone to, handle it somewhere else in, you know, in other people's houses or in kindergarten. So I think that that's what we do with our youth. There's something that has, that is complicated to, to analyze and to understand the context, then we do it with them. We don't, let, we don't let them do it somewhere else where they don't have the tools to analyze the complexities. Um, so, so I think that it is on to us to, to help them analyze and to have these honest conversations. Um, and in terms of how do, you know, it's interesting, I'm sure that many of um, your youth and maybe even many of your adults have um, many layers of criticism against the, the British government. And how do you encourage patriotism in the same time as you work for social change? I think it's a very similar question. Um, and I think it's also a, little, a lot about empowerment, about how do we make these young people think, feel that they have a say and they have a way to impact and they have, um, and they have a role to play. It's, it's you know, it's, it's both a uh, privilege and a responsibility that they have to, 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 to take part in this, uh, in this Zionist enterprise. Um, and you know, I think that we have a unique um, role and obligation here that I feel in many communities and specifically Jewish communities, there are two kind of layers of discourse that are contradictory. One is the um, Israeli propaganda, Hasbalah narrative that says, you know, we have no partner. Israel, the IDF is the most moral army in the world and basically Israel can do no wrong. And our youth hate that, right? They're totally not into that. And then the second narrative that's becoming more and more common is saying, you know, there's a huge moral crisis in Israel. And so our, our response is BDS. And it is on to us to figure out the middle narrative that says, 
there's a huge moral crisis in Israel, and our response is to engage more and be partners to a solution. Um, and how do we craft that, how we craft that, um, that message internationally with Jews from all over the world and Jews in Israel is our, um, is our task, but I think that we are uniquely positioned to do that with the, the network that we have and the influence that we have. And I think that that's, that's the right narrative. You know, the only way to change things here is to engage. Um, and I think that once we figure out a way to, to um, channel uh, the energy towards engagement, then, then we can have a real, a real impact, which I think is what most of the youth that I've been talking to are into. They want impact. And once they feel that they have impact, then they can develop that sentiment. No, we've had a, a couple more questions come in. I think the first sort of uh, continues on what you were speaking about. The question is, uh, when we hear what's going on in Israel about the government's actions and lack of aspirations for peace, it feels very depressing. How do you feel about Israel's future? This is a really not a big question at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I am sometimes very, very depressed um, as well. Uh, but I don't, I think depression is not an answer. Um, I mean, it's, it's certainly human, but um, I, I think that I'm, I'm reminded that every few decades there is an anti-democratic wave and our, and I think that right now around the world, there's an anti-democratic wave and maybe Israel was one of the first places where the wave really um, hit very hard. But I think that issues of freedom of the press and corruption and separation of, um, of different, different arms of government are happening all over the world. Um, and it is our role to, to figure out a way to, to push back and protect and expand our democratic sphere. Uh, and I think that it's about our determination and our persistence in being able to do that. So the next question that's come in, Noah, relates to Masa Israel. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is a uh, program for anyone international to come to Israel from 18 to 30, uh, participate in internship programs and things of that nature. Gap years as well actually count for Masa Israel. So the question relates to, do, does Iraq work at all with Masa uh, and do they offer any internships to post-college graduate students? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. So first of all, um, I mean, Masa doesn't work with us. Uh, it's not that we don't work with them. We're happy to work with them, but they've uh, been a little reluctant to work with us. But um, um, we, uh, we do have an, uh, an internship program and um, I'm happy to, there, there is information on our website on how to apply. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, as a Masa alumni, I always appreciate Masa questions. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll take a few more questions if, if there are any this evening. I don't want to, um, you know, continue the conversation longer than people are invested this evening. Uh, but we'll give it just a few more minutes while people think of some of those last questions. I do want to, uh, as Noah brought to our attention, the idea of Art Zenu and the involvement here in the UK with Zionism. Um, specifically, the, the current movement here, Art Zenu UK, which is formerly known as Pro Zion, is a huge base for change uh, within Israel. So if you are interested in joining, maybe you're already a member, please reach out. Uh, you can reach out through this session. You can, uh, there'll be a link sent to you after that will allow you to register and get more involved. And it's a really exciting time to sort of see what change we can do here. That's not just solely um, helping organizations in Israel, but doing what we can from here as well as. So it's, it's both hand in hand. Um, Let's go back here, and I see a couple more questions have popped through. So, um, Noah, let's see. 
Oh, actually, and, and the person just says you, you answered that. So it was a question about what can the diaspora do to support things like IREC. So obviously, um, as you can clearly attest to, Noah, donations to IREC directly are a huge help, um, but also then sort of that political movement through the Zionism backwaters as well through Art Zainu, it, that really seems to be kind of twofold, yes? Um, so absolutely, I think, you know, if we, if we want to, to dive deeper into that question, you know, um, both, of the, both of the things that you mentioned are extremely important. And I'm also inviting you to um, um, sign up to our, a newsletter that also gives very concrete tools of how you can support us and how you can be involved in our struggles. I think it's important to note the incredible influence that um, the diaspora Jews have in Israel. Um, and I think that our long-term task is a question of how we both develop that power through Zionist institutions and otherwise, uh, and, and clarify, you know, goals in addition to the Western wall and the conversion issue, which are very important to expand our influence and the influence of our values in Israel. Noah, can you talk a little bit about recently, I know some of the participants will have seen that rabbis um, from all over the world, including uh, rabbis from actually many different denominations, even outside of the progressive sphere, joined in calling for change on the asylum seeker issue that's uh, and the, the issues that are happening in Israel. And here they actually met with the ambassador and spoke with him directly to, you know, deliver a letter to say, you know, we, we're not okay. This is not our values. This is not rabbinic values. These are not Jewish values. What, what's going on? Uh, and I know Iraq has been really at the forefront of that in Israel itself. Can you tell us more about what's happening with that and what has been going on? Sure. So actually, um, last weekend we were in um, um, uh, a demonstration in South Tel Aviv uh, against the deportation of refugees. And Rabbi Lear was there with some of uh, our young uh, British uh, representatives, and that was a lot of fun to see them in the demonstration, helping, uh, helping, and you know, being part of that experience. Um, but just uh, to back up a little bit, um, you know, I I'm zooming out and zooming out. So Israel is the only Western country that has a land border with Africa, uh, and that's important to note as a challenge. Um, and certainly in terms of the small size of our population and the enormity of the social challenges in Israel, that means that Israel, I think to me, that means that Israel has the, the right and the obligation to formulate a responsible immigration policy. Um, the, the, and, 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 and indeed in Israel, since uh, in the past uh, 15 years, there were about 70,000 um, uh, immigrants from, uh, from Africa who came into Israel by foot, m the large majority of them asking for a refugee status in Israel. Israel is, is signed and was one of the, initiate, uh, the initiators of the Geneva Convention that obligates us to offer assistance to uh, people fleeing basically genocide. Um, and, and unfortunately, so and 70,000 people is 1% of our population. So that's a lot. Um, uh, unfortunately, what the Israeli government has done is exactly the opposite of formulating a responsible immigration policy. Israel has not even, most of the people applied for refugee status. Israel has not even looked into those uh, requests, not denying them, just leaving people without status. Uh, and directing them to li live in one of the most poor neighborhoods in Israel, in South Tel Aviv. Uh, and, you know, this putting them on, you know, on the backs of the poorest population in Israel yeah. has led to a lot of tensions. Since then, Can I ask you to pause then, for just a second? We, we had a video then, and sound delay. Okay. Are we okay now? Yes. Thank you. If you could continue. I appreciate it. Um, so, um, so the, um, so the, 
so and since since then we've had about 30,000 of the refugees of the asylum seekers that came in have already left. So now we are with 35 to 40,000 uh, asylum seekers in Israel from South Sudan and Eritrea uh, who have uh, an unresolved status. And also the Israeli government has had no policy in terms of, you know, accommodations, uh, employment, etc. So they have basically centered in one place or about half of them centered in one place. Um, and the Israeli government for many different reasons have focused on them as a target group for evil in Israel. Um, and uh, of this, despite the fact that the Israeli government has neglected these southern Tel Aviv neighborhoods for many, many years before the asylum seekers claims that on the asylum seeker population. Um, and following a very, very long legal debate, the Israeli government has begun in, on January 1st to issue deportation, um, uh, deportation notices to asylum seekers in Israel. Um, and basically the current plan of the government is to deport all of those 35,000 to 40,000 people um, to Uganda or Rwanda where the, ev the mounting evidence is that they're not gonna be safe there and uh, sending them to a very, very unclear future. They're not gonna have status there. And we've had many different um, uh, accounts of the horrors that they go through when they go there. Um, I wanna put two caveats on the current situation. Families, uh, meaning children, women, and, and fathers, if they're in the picture, are not gonna be deported. Uh, and currently South Sudanese um, uh, asylum seekers are not gonna be deported, but that's just temporarily. Um, and uh, right now we're, we are, we're working very hard to protest that decision. It's arbitrary. They've not determined that these people are not legitimately asylum seekers and they're deporting them into real danger. Um, I think there's, it's, I'm very encouraged by the public response. You know, we've had people from pilots who said that they wouldn't fly the planes and doctors and people in academia and former judges and former, you know, Many, many different people in, in society are organizing against the deportation, and I think we have a real chance at blocking it. And one of those efforts was a resolution passed um, with the help of Artenu and the leadership of Artenu against the deportation in the Zionist organizations. Thank you so much for tackling that um, very difficult issue and, and giving some outward explanation as well. I think it's uh, really helpful for those who uh, are just learning about the issue to, to have a deeper understanding. So thank you for doing that. Um, we haven't had any more questions come in. So I think we're, we're gonna just sort of start to wrap up. Is there any last things you would like to leave us with, Rabana? I just, I just you know, want us all to remember that um, in terms of statehood, 70 is very young. Uh, and so we are still in state building stages and everybody who's here in terms of, you know, their physical presence or their energies and volunteer and, and resources around the world, we're going to be the ones setting the trajectory. Um, so all of us can be involved in this exciting, sometimes frustrating and sometimes exhilarating uh, project. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you take the time to participate in the webinar today. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of all of the partners within the Alliance for Progressive Judaism's Israel Desk, I want to thank you for your time, Noah. For our attendees, thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings. I know um, many of you work and have spouses and children and responsibilities, and, and we really thank you for your time. To uh, remind everyone, next week uh, we will have another session and at the same time, same place. This session will also feature a live component at 
uh, Ealing Liberal, uh, excuse me, East London and Essex Liberal Synagogue, as well as the Zoom feature. So you can join in either way in the discussion. If you have any questions, comments, or follow up, you will receive emails from me in the coming days, but you're always welcome to connect uh, with me here. Thank you again, Rabbi Noah. I do so much appreciate it. Please, uh, everyone, get in contact with IRAC and with Art Zainu here in the UK to help further the social change that is the young state of Israel. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.